This is going to be three simple lessons you can learn from 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse by verse. Starting in verse 1, Paul says, But I, I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. So Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was very rough. Uh, he said in 1 Corinthians 4.21, What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? So they are a baby Christian, carnal and worldly. They're a worldly church. Paul wanted them to get things right before he came to them face to face. And if he could send them an epistle to make them realize their guilt of sin, and then when he got there, it wouldn't be in heaviness or in sorrow. So he says, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. So if he can send them an epistle that's kind of rough and get them to get things right, then they'll be right when he gets there. And, you know, they can just have a good fellowship in the Lord. So, he determined this with himself, he says in verse 1. He thought it over with himself about these things. And at one time, Paul said, I think myself happy. He determines things with himself. Something that is a blessing of God, that God's give you the ability to be able to think about things with yourself anytime that you want to. That's a blessing. Anytime you want to, you can just think. Have you ever thought about that? How you can just be sitting, you can be working and thinking about things. When I'm working, if I'm not listening to preaching or my audio Bible, then I'm going over the chapter I'm trying to memorize for the week. I'm going over it in my head. I'm thinking about the next study I can do. I can pray to the Lord in my mind. It's a blessing to be able to do that. Thank God for these little things, just thinking. He gave the ability to think. On the other hand, the thought life can be a burden and a curse on people if they have put the wrong things in their mind. Many people have a problem with lust. Many people have a problem with worry. A good and clean thought life, though, can be very beneficial to the Christian. So 2 Corinthians 2, 2, 2, 2. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. So Paul used tough love, so that when he comes, he won't be sorrowful, but rejoicing in the fact that they've repented and are doing right. They got the things right and fixed that he wrote to them about. So they face tough love. Can you face tough love from your pastor or an elder in the faith? 2 Corinthians 2, 3. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. So you shouldn't have to have sorrow caused from other Christians. These are the ones that should make you full of joy, that you can fellowship with, that you can talk about the Bible with. There are times when you rejoice with them. You rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. But hopefully it won't be weeping over the consequences of their sins. Verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. So Paul cared about his converts. Paul's epistles probably had big, big circles on them from the tear stains. And he isn't writing these things just to grieve the Corinthians. He wants them to get right so that they won't be in grief. The way of transgressors is hard. That is what brings grief. He also shows them tough love because he does love them. The reason your pastor gets on to you about things is because he loves you. The reason your mother gets on to you about things is because he, she loves you. She's trying to save you from grief. So face tough love. And next, forgive like a child. Paul is going to talk about the man in 1 Corinthians 5, the man who Paul told the Corinthians they should put away from the church because this man committed fornication with his brother's wife. In 1 Corinthians 5.13 it says, But them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. This man sinned big time. However, he repents and gets right with the Lord. 
And back in 1 Corinthians, the people were just letting him get by with what he was doing. Now the tables have turned, and they aren't accepting him back after he's repented. Paul wants them to forgive him. Verse 5 says, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. So this sin has grieved Paul, but only in part. It affected the church and the family of the man who sinned more than it affected Paul. Paul doesn't want to overcharge them all. He doesn't want to hammer everyone over a sin that not everybody's committing. It says in verse 6, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So the punishment was sufficient. He was kicked out of the church and delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And the humiliation of being kicked out of the church by many people was a huge punishment. It was sufficient. Now he has gotten right. He's been punished and he's repented. So Paul says in verse 7, So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So if a brother sins and has repented and he's trying to do right, then just forgive him. As it says in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So you need to watch out about not forgiving somebody. If you were in their shoes, you would be guilty of the same sin, most likely. Forgive him and comfort him. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, how Paul talks about comforting them who are in any trouble. And if a man's gotten right, then forgive him. 70 times 7. Jesus forgives you for all the bad stuff that you do. A lot of people have this attitude towards somebody like, I hope the Lord blesses him, but I can't fellowship with him because he did this and this or something like that. So the Lord fellowships with him, but you're saying that you can't. The Lord's going to bless him. You hope the Lord blesses him, but you're not going to have fellowship with him. Doesn't that make you more sanctified than God himself? If you're going to be that way. Now verse 7. So that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. Lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So if a Christian is trying to do right. And you reject him from fellowship, fellowshipping with you. Then the Lord will hold you responsible. For letting them be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Maybe even being discouraged to the point of quitting. Some preachers won't fellowship with another preacher. Because they are so scared that another preacher will look down on them for it. And that's not right. Who cares if they look down on you? They are the ones who are in the wrong. I can be friends with any Christian I want to be friends with. I can fellowship with any Christian who's trying to live right. No other preacher or Baptist pope has any right to tell me who I can like or be friends with or listen to. That's why you hear me recommend all kinds of people, all kinds of teachers and Christian men to learn from. It's the outcasts that God really uses anyway. The most, anyway. 2 Corinthians 2.8 Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Don't just say I forgive you, but actually show it by taking him back in and not bringing up what happened before. Confirm your love toward the person. So he says in verse 9 and 10, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So Paul is letting them know that they need to forgive the man. He's also letting them know that if they forgive him, then he also forgives him. If other saints are willing to forgive a man who is trying, then why are you so spiritual that you can't forgive him? Paul said, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. So Paul can look at a man and say his sins are forgiven with the authority of Jesus Christ. This is because the Bible tells us that it's so. I can claim 1 John 1, 9 to someone who has confessed and forsaken their sins. Because it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can look at you and by the authority of the scripture, I can look at you and tell you you're forgiven if you've done that. I can say your sins are forgiven. I'm not the one forgiving it. God is. But I can look at you 
with the authority of the Bible and tell you your sins are forgiven if you've done what 1 John 1, 9 says. And if a person is lost, I can look at a person and tell them their sins are eternally forgiven if they will believe on Jesus Christ. Now look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. This proves unforgiveness is a device of the devil, and he will use it to keep the Lord's work from being done. So forgive like a child. The Bible says in James 3.16, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. The best thing to do with people is forgive and forget. That will help your marriage. If you forgive quickly and forget even quicker, be like a child when it comes to forgiveness. As a kid, when you got in a fight with your buddy, it wasn't 10 minutes and you'd be playing hide and seek together again. Uh, when I spank my daughter in a few minutes, she's coming up and hugging me again. Kids forgive and forget quickly. Adults need to be like a child in these things. So, face tough love, forgive like a child, and next, fellowship with the saints. Second Corinthians 2.12 says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me of the Lord, so Paul is preaching Christ's gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 shows us that the gospel is how Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and resurrected. If you're willing to preach that gospel, then the Lord will open a door for you, even if it is a little door. He said in verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So Paul is looking for Titus, his brother in the Lord. Paul is big on fellowshipping with the saints. He had no rest in his spirit because he hadn't found him yet. Verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So Paul says he causeth us to triumph. Paul knows the Lord has other people who are Christians besides himself, and Paul's life is about others. And Paul knows that when Christians get together as Bible believers, then they can do great things for God, and the Lord causes them to triumph. And even if we take a loss down here, we know that God still gives us victory. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty seven. But thanks be unto God, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Psalms 98, 1. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things, his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. So verse 14 in 2 Corinthians 2, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. If you're saved, then you have already won. He always causeth us to triumph. And where it says he maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place, he's referring to the fact that God uses us to give out his knowledge. When a person gets saved, they come to the knowledge of the truth. Preach to them. As it says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So God uses us to give out the knowledge of God that we found in the scriptures. He maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And he says in fifth, verse 15, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. If you're saved, then you need to be a sweet savor of Christ to save people. You need to go around showing your faith. Talk about the Bible. Talk about the things of God, not the things of the world. To saved and lost people, we, we give off a savor. And in verse 16, it says, To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So we are the savor of death unto death. That is, to a lost man. To a lost man, you remind him of sin, his coming death. You're the savor of death to a lost man. He smells death and the consequences of his sins. You stink to him. You take, away, you take away all the fun of his flesh when you're around. He knows he shouldn't cuss around you or talk about his fornication around you. You stink to him. 
A good reason you need Christian fellowship is because to a safe person, you are the saver of life and life. To another Christian who's living right, you're a breath of fresh air. Every now and then, I'll find a King James Bible believer at work that I might train on the job or something. That's every now and then. And it's good when I get someone who doesn't hate the King James Bible. They are a saver of life unto life. I've got life, and they have life. It says in Second Corinthians 2.17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. The way we can make manifest the savor of his knowledge is by reading the uncorrupted word of God. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. We open the Bible and whatever it says, this is what is right. The new Bibles take out the word corrupt and they put pedal there because they know they corrupt the words themselves. I'm not going to change one word. If I can change one word, then how do I know the other ones don't need to be changed? How do I know any of it's right? And what would be the point of anything that we're doing? We have a final authority. That is the King James Bible. I have no right to correct the authority. I don't know everything in the Bible. I don't know what everything means. I'm bound to be wrong on a lot of things that I believe about. But I'm not going to change the Bible to fit what I believe. I just want to approach it with a sincere attitude. Having a final authority will help your fellowship because then you guys can always go back to the Bible over a disagreement. And whatever it says, you can go with that and solve the argument. But that's three things you need to do. Face tough love. Face what your pastor says. Forgive like a child. Forgive your brothers and sisters in Christ. Forgive your wife. And then fellowship with the saints. Be around others. You can't even do the first two things unless you're around other Christians. But this has been 2 Corinthians chapter 2.